Well, as we uh, continue our worship this morning in the Word, let's just take a few moments to prepare our hearts and minds by bowing once again in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful once again to come to worship you in song, to declare that, Jesus, you are worthy of our worship and our praise. You're glorious, you're great, and you're the one who came to die for our sins and forgive them. Thank you for that. We're grateful for that. Lord, as we continue our worship in your word this morning, we pray that your Holy Spirit would go before us, that you would prepare our hearts, uh, that you would soften them so that the seed of the word can, can be planted, take root, and bear fruit unto righteousness. Father, what we know not this morning, teach us. What we have not, give us. And who we are not in Christ, we ask that you would make us, and we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, whenever my wife and I go on a trip or go on a vacation, my wife is uh, what I like to describe as the, the, the person who plans everything. She's the one who, after we've chosen the destination, she plans everything from the place we're going to stay to the activities that we're going to do. And every trip that we take and every vacation that we're on, she's almost like my very own travel agency. And every trip, you know, like the day of an activity, I really don't know what's going to happen. And so every trip we go on is almost like a mystery trip for me. And it's always exciting. She always does a great job of planning everything. But while my wife does most of the planning as the travel agent of the family, there's one part of the planning. If we're away for a weekend from our home church, I ask her to leave to me. And I always ask her to allow me to choose the church that we're going to attend. But whenever we're away from our church home, uh, I always think it's a good thing to bring Jesus with us, <laughs> to make sure that Jesus is a top priority. And we want to model that for our children, that whether we are attending church on a regular basis, our home church, or we're away, that corporate worship is a priority for us. And so uh, whenever we, I look for a church for us to, to worship at, how many of you know it can be challenging sometimes? And the reason it can be challenging is because, like most of you, I want to be discerning in regards to the church we attend. I want to be discerning for the sake of Christ, for the sake of our family, that where we worship, Christ would be exalted and he would be worshipped in spirit and in truth. I want to be discerning like you because we have children and we not only want them to feel comfortable and desire to come to church, but we want to bring them to a place, even though it's just one Sunday, where they're going to be nourished and fed the truth of God's word, where they're going to hear a clear articulation of the gospel message of Jesus. So as God draws their hearts to himself, they would come and trust in Jesus as their savior and their Lord. And we've been gone for a couple weeks. We went on a trip and we brought uh, our parents with us. My wife brought her parents and I brought my mom with us. And so I wanted to be discerning, especially on this trip we went on these past couple weeks because my in-laws on rare occasions attend church. They're Buddhists, they're not believers, and we don't force them to go to church. We tell them, hey, this is just part of our schedule and we'll be attending church, but would you like to come with us? And so I want to be discerning to the point that I know that the church that we attend and that they attend, the gospel is going to be clearly articulated. And so I want to be discerning like all of you. And thankfully, we, we, uh, the past two Sundays, we've been gone. We, we've had an opportunity to be at a couple churches. And we really believe Christ was exalted. The people of God were edified. And evangelism, evangelism seemed to be a priority. At, at the end of one of the services, we were in Canada. We turned to our daughters at the end of the service and said, hey, after they had left their classes, their kids' classes they were in, we said, what do you think of the church? And they said, oh, mommy, daddy, we loved this church. Then they said this, but we love our church, <laughs> and we can't wait to go back. This morning, I, I'd like to say I share that sentiment. There's nothing like being with the local church, you, the body of believers that you know well, and you can spend time with. This morning, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles, if you have them, to 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll be in verses 10 to 22 together. And what I want to take some time to talk about this morning is why it's so important to be discerning. Why, it's, why is it so important to be discerning when it comes to the church you and I attend or the churches we recommend? 
Why is it so important to be discerning when it comes to the podcasts we listen to or the ministries we allow to influence us, our children, or, or we recommend to others? Why is it so important to be discerning when it comes to Christian resources, Christian books, Christian streaming services? Why is it so important to be discerning? And 2 Peter, up to this point in chapter 2, has been telling us why. Because false teachers are inevitable and false teachers are dangerous. In the first three verses of chapter 2 that really set us up for where we are today, we were introduced to a description of false teachers. And these are those who secretly and deceptively bring in destructive heresies. They deny the Lord who bought them. They're, they bring on themselves swift destruction. In verses 4 to 10, Peter described how dangerous they are because all those who follow them experience the same fate, and the fate of false teachers is the same as those of Sodom and Gomorrah who were judged by God. And so we're told in verses 4 to 10 that false teachers are dangerous because of their fate. It's that of punishment. It's that of judgment. Well, as we continue through chapter 2 and verses 10 to 22, where we are today, uh, Peter is going to elaborate on this description of false teachers and talk to us not just why they're so dangerous, but why we need to be so discerning when it comes to the church we attend, the podcasts we listen to, and the Christian resources that are available to us or that we make available to others. And so would you stand in honor of the reading of the word, 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll be reading verse 10 to the end of the chapter. Verse 10 reads this way, And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls." They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. They, these are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever." For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome." The latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. The word of the Lord, you all may be seated in the presence of God this morning. As we walk through our text, we get to hear some harsh descriptions of false teachers. And what we're considering together is why is it so important to be discerning? Why should we take it seriously when it comes to the churches we attend or recommend, the podcasts we listen to, or the Christian resources we are made, that are made available to us or that we recommend and make available to others? And what we're told here in our text is because false teachers are dangerous. And because they are dangerous, we get to hear how dangerous they truly are. I'd like to talk about three things that tell us how dangerous false teachers are and why it's so important to be discerning. First, because false teachers are rebellious in nature. They're rebellious in nature. Verse 10 begins by reminding us why their judgment is justified. 
Why their judgment is the same judgment that came upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the wicked in the days of Noah. The reason is because they indulge the flesh. They act like Christians. They call themselves Christians, but they don't walk according to the Spirit. They don't produce the fruit of the Spirit, but instead they indulge the flesh. The text also tells us they despise authority and therefore their judgment is justified. They despise authority, not just the authority of God, but the authorities that have been appointed by God. And as they despise authority, what Peter is doing for you and I is giving us the ability to discern them when they present themselves. Why do we need to be discerning of them? Because back in verse 1 of chapter 2, we learn that they secretly and deceptively bring in destructive heresies. When we were in the first three verses, we said that a false teacher will not come up to you in the local church claiming to be a Christian and say, just want you to know, by the way, I'm a false teacher. They won't show up in your small group and tell you, in my conversations, I'm going to lead this group astray. If you read the opening of their book or an introduction to them when they speak, they're not going to say, the fate of this false teacher and all who follow them is certain judgment. And so these false teachers, they come in deceptively, secretly. These are not individuals coming from the outside in, but are coming out from the inside out. And the way Jesus described them are wolves in sheep's clothing. And so they call themselves Christians. They use the vocabulary of Christians. But how do you discern them? Well, because they indulge the flesh. Because they despise authority, there are two traits that characterize them in verse 10. It tells us uh, they are presumptuous and they are self-willed. First, the manner in which you can spot a false teacher is they are presumptuous in their rebellious nature. The word presumptuous means to be daring. It means to be bold. It's overly confident. They, in ignorance, speak about things they don't know about. And so they are confident and bold. And sometimes you take a look at somebody who, 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 who teaches or preaches with some sense of conviction. And because they believe it themselves, some people follow them. They draw big crowds, and they are presumptuous and bold. Now, when we think of confidence, we think, yeah, confidence is a, a good quality, right? We want to be confident in ourselves. We want our children to be confident. But the kind of confidence we're talking about here is a false confidence. It's a confidence that lacks wisdom, the wisdom of God, and lacks humility because it despises the authority of God and all the authorities that have been appointed by God. These individuals are presumptuous. Not only are they presumptuous, the other trait is they are self-willed, stubborn. In their stubbornness, they desire to live a life to please themselves and no one else. They live to please themselves, not God. They don't seek to please others, but they seek to please themselves, and it's all about them. They are self-willed. These individuals who are self-willed are those who are willing to defy God in order to get the desires of their hearts. This morning, we've got to consider our hearts this morning as well. Have you ever knew something was a sin but did it anyway? That's what it means to be self-willed. You know in your willing disobedience that God calls this and oh, I'll just ask for forgiveness later. This is what it means to be self-willed. These are individuals who know what is right, but defy God nonetheless in order to satisfy and gratify the desires of their flesh. They are self-willed. And as those who are boldly arrogant, as those who are those who are rebellious in nature. It tells us something about them in the end of verse 10. It says, it says, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. As those who are boldly arrogant, they speak about things that they don't understand. And these dignitaries here probably refers to fallen angels. In the original Greek, it says glories. The reason these false excuse me, not false teacher, this is referring to fallen angels, fallen angels. And the reason these fallen angels are described as glories here is not because they are glorious like God, but they have immense power. 
When you take a look at Satan, he's described in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 31, as the ruler of this world. Now, it doesn't mean that we should fear Satan or fear the demonic realm, but we should respect the power that they have and understand the spiritual beings. And what these individuals are doing is they are speaking evil of fallen angels. They are speaking evil of the invisible spiritual realm which they don't understand. I don't know, sometimes you turn on the television and you see some individuals who... uh, act like they know what they're doing and they start binding Satan. They start stomping demons and casting out demons. These are individuals who act like they're Christians, who have the vocabulary of Christians, but they don't fully understand the reality or the power of the spiritual beings which they claim to cast out or they claim to stomp on. These are counterfeit Christians who act like believers and they make a big show about it. And so these individuals are those who speak evil of these dignitaries, these fallen angels. And verse 11 gives us a little bit more details there. It says this, whereas angels, this is probably talking not about fallen angels, but good angels, whereas angels who are greater in power and might, greater in power and might, that could be greater in power and might than these fallen angels. But I'd like to suggest it talks about greater in power and might than these false teachers, I'd like to suggest that angels have a, a higher rank, a higher power even than humans. And it tells us here, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. What is he talking about there? Well, Jude probably gives us an answer. If you flip over to Jude, verses 8 to 9, you'll read this. Because 2 Peter closely resembles Jude, it says, Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Verse 9, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So what we're talking about here is a powerful angel, an archangel by the name of Michael, who does not himself rebuke Satan, but tells the Lord to rebuke him. So there are individuals who who, who think they have a proper understanding of the invisible spiritual realm, and they even revile the demonic, because you think to yourself, you speak evil of fallen angels, that sounds fine. But these are individuals who don't even understand who they are talking about and are declaring authority over those they have no authority over. You can do nothing apart from the person and work of Jesus Christ. I always tell folks, why are you binding Satan? Why are you telling Satan to get behind you? Why are you binding demons? You don't have to do that. You've got the Lord Jesus Christ to take care of it for you. I feel like I'm a little child holding the hand of my heavenly father. And when I'm holding the hand of Jesus who fights my battles for me, so I don't need to tell Satan, get behind me. I don't need to bind Satan, but I allow Jesus to fight my battles for me. And I fight my battles on my knees. In a moment, we'll talk more about that in Ephesians 6, and we'll talk about that in James, how to go about spiritual warfare. And so, the manner in which these individuals are described is they are rebellious in in nature. They are rebellious in nature, they are presumptuous, they are self-willed, and in their bold arrogance, they speak about, they speak evil about these fallen angels in ways that they are ignorant and they speak untruths about them because they don't even understand what they are talking about. And the major takeaway of verses 10 to 11 is they are rebellious in nature. So why do we need to be discerning? Because false teachers are dangerous. Uh, How can we be discerning? I'd like to give you a couple takeaways here. First, be discerning by identifying false teachers by their rebellious nature. They deceptively, secretly bring in destructive heresies. And so you should see them for what they are based on their rebellious character. They indulge the flesh. They despise authority. They are presumptuous and they are self-willed. They seek to please no one but themselves. They are overly confident, but only confident in their ignorance, their willful ignorance, not knowing the truth of who God is. 
is. So be discerning of false teachers. When it comes to the churches you choose, the podcasts you listen to, the Christian resources or materials that are available to you or you make available to others. Secondly, be discerning by avoiding their example. This text is given to us not just so that we would avoid false teachers and not follow them because their fate is that of judgment and all those who follow them, but in order for us to avoid the sin that they walk in. And so as we walk through our text this morning, the invitation is not just to be discerning in regards to how we find a false teacher, but to ask, God, is there anything in my heart that resembles the nature of these false teachers? In any way, in terms of my nature, am I rebellious? Do I despise authority? Do I indulge the flesh or do I walk in the spirit? And so we are to avoid their example. This morning I'd invite us to confess anything in our heart that would resemble rebellion or disobedience. This morning, if you take a look at the past few hours, the past few days, the past few weeks, or maybe even this past year, what were their ways where you reflected these false teachers as they indulge the flesh? To indulge the flesh means that you don't produce the fruit of the Spirit, you produce the opposite. Instead of producing love, there's hatred, there's unforgiveness. Instead of joy, there's misery. Uh, A miserable Christian should be an oxymoron. God, in his spirit, produces in us that love and that joy and that peace. The question is, am I indulging my flesh in a way that I see the fruit that comes out of it? It's rotten because it's anxiety and worry and stress instead of the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Instead of praying about everything, I'm worrying about it. And so love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control should be those things that should be produced in my life if I'm connected to Christ. But in what ways have we been indulging the flesh that we need to confess as sin and repent of? Not just when we're talking about indulging the flesh, but also despising authority. For all the believers, the Christians in the room, you say, well, I don't despise the authority of God. I don't despise the authorities that he has appointed. But Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Is there any area of your life that's out of alignment with his will and his word? God doesn't tell us he wants 90% of our life or 99% of our life. No, he wants 100% of our hearts. He wants 100% of our lives. Is there an area of your life or mine that is walking in, in which we are walking in disobedience to his will or his word? Is there an attitude that's out of alignment that we can confess and that we can, we can repent of? In terms of being presumptuous and, 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 and bold and brazen, is there any way that you start your day and say, I don't need to pray, I don't need to be in his word? That to be so bold and overly confident, to have a false confidence that you're not relying on God, but saying, I can go about it myself. Is there any way that you've been self-willed, seeking to, 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 to live in such a way that you please yourself and no one else, in such a way that you're willing to defy God, even though you know God calls it sin, but you do it anyway? That's what it means to be self-willed. This morning, we are invited to be discerning, not just to false teachers, but in any way that our hearts should reflect the character traits of these false teachers. And the reason this is here is so that we would, in confession of sin and repentance, align ourselves with God and serve him and give him our whole hearts, our whole lives. Not just say, Lord, you've got Sunday and you've got about 30 minutes of my morning each day, but Lord, you have my life. You have my heart. You have my mind. Be discerning, avoiding their example, confessing and repenting. Secondly, by adopting a biblical understanding of spiritual warfare. James chapter, or Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 to 13, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of, these age, age, of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Spiritual warfare is a reality that we face, but how do we deal with it? We go around binding demons or casting out demons or talking to Satan. No, it says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. 
that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You stand firm in your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. You take up the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. You take up the sword of truth. You've got your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The manner in which you fight spiritual warfare is by never getting into the ring. You allow God to fight your battles for you. I always say, if you feel like you're in a spiritual battle at the beginning of the day, the best way to win and to win every time is to never get into the ring. When you hear Satan knocking at the door, you don't answer the door. You allow the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died and rose in newness of life, to fight your battles for you. We fight our battles on our knees, and Jesus is the one who will rebuke Satan. I don't know about you, but I'm not so sure Satan is going to be rebuked when I do so. I'm certain that he will if Jesus rebukes him. I'd rather trust in him for that. As we read in James 4, 7 to 10, how do you fight your battles? It says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? By means of submitting to God. That's why it says that there first. To submit to God means, okay, God, you are my Savior, and also you are my Lord, and I line myself under your will and your authority. God, I don't feel like praying this morning, but I'm going to pray anyways because it's in obedience to your will and to your word. I'm going to align myself under your authority. So submit to God, obey him, serve him, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We get more how to do that. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. God never left your side. He's always there. He's everywhere. But what the text is saying is lean into God, and you will see him. You'll experience him. You'll experience the victory that comes with walking with Jesus. You'll experience the joy that comes with walking with Jesus, the peace that transcends all understanding. Then it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Walk in confession and repentance. To confess your sins is to say, God, you call this sin, and so do I. I'm responsible for it. I'm deserving of your punishment. But in regards to what 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sins, you are faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Not only do you provide the means by which I'm forgiven, you provide me the power to walk in holiness and purity. And verse 9 says, lament, mourn, and weep. It's not just about confessing your sin, but repentance is about having a broken heart over your sin, recognizing how weak you are and how powerful God is. So lament, warm, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. How do you fight those spiritual battles? By means of submitting to God, resisting the devil, and he will flee from you. Confess your sin. Walk in repentance. Have a contrite, broken heart over sin. And as you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you. And so, why are false teachers so dangerous? Why do we need to be discerning? Because they're rebellious in nature. Secondly, because they are full of sensuality and immorality. They come in deceptively and secretly, bring in these destructive heresies, but they're full of sensuality. That's what we read about in verses 12 to 16. Sensuality is not a term that I use every day. To to, to pursue a heart full of sensuality is to gratify the, the, the senses. It, it has to do with whatever you see, whatever you smell, whatever you touch, you want it, you get it, and you keep it for yourself. It, it's, the, it's the cry of our culture. It's the song of our society. Follow your heart, right? That's what the, the, our society says. You know, the highest ethic, the, the highest virtue, moral excellence as defined in our culture is to follow your own heart and be tolerant of everyone else as they follow their heart. You think that following your heart will lead to happiness, but in the end it leads to misery. And so what we're reminded of this morning is when you take a look at the word of God, we're not told to follow our hearts and to pursue sensuality, gratifying our lusts and the desires of our flesh. We are called not to follow our heart, but to follow Christ. Jeremiah tells us something about our hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Actually, don't listen to your heart. Listen to what God's word has to say. Don't listen to your feelings or your instincts. 
The text tells us here, my heart will deceive me. My heart tends to make me think more highly of myself than, 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 than I am, you know? You know, you hear a message or you're in a study and you think to yourself, oh, this is a good message for so-and-so. Not for me. Your heart will easily deceive you. And then it tells us desperately wicked who can know it. But Matthew 16, 24 says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Deny the desires of your heart and make Jesus Christ your one and only pursuit. But these false teachers... They capture the song of our society and the cry of our culture to follow your heart. And that is what they exercise. They pursue sensuality. They gratify their senses and the lusts and the desires of their heart. And they give permission to others to do the same. How do they gratify their desires? First, they do so as Peter describes them as irrational beasts, as irrational animals. You know, these false teachers pride themselves as being those who are spiritually wise and have spiritual insights. But Peter says, I want you to see them for what they are, irrational beasts who are born to be captured and to be destroyed. You read in verse 12, it said, but these like natural brute beasts, brute means unreasonable. They, they don't think with reason. They, are, they follow their instincts. And because they follow their instincts, because they follow their own desires, instead of following the rationale of the word of God and the truth of God's word to guide and direct their path, their fate is that of animals. Those who are hunted, those who are born to be hunted, to be captured, and to be destroyed. So this is not just warning us about the nature of false teachers. It's once again reminding us of their fate and all those who follow them. These are individuals who are irrational animals who are to be captured and are to be destroyed. It says, speak evil of the things they do not understand. This speaks of their presumptuous nature. They are bold and, and, and they, are, they, are, they are audacious in terms of, 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 of talking about things they don't even understand. And it says, and will utterly perish in their own Corruption. In the original Greek, it really speaks not just of the evil they do, but the result of what they have done. Their end will be corruption. And then verse 13, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness. And so how do they pursue their own desires, their senses, and the pleasures that they desire, the appetites of their hearts? How do they gratify them as irrational animals? Oh, makes us think sometimes. Are there times when you and I follow the desires of our heart or the feelings that we have rather than building our life on the truth of God's word. We're honest this morning. There are times when our hearts reflect that of the false teachers. And the reminder this morning is not only don't follow the false teachers, but don't follow them in the sin that they participate in. This is so convicting because I find myself at times feeling one way. There are times when I wake up in the morning, can I be honest? And I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like reading the Bible, but I know I need to do it anyways because I'm not going to follow my feeling. I'm going to follow the truth of the word of God. It tells us, and they will receive the wages of unrighteousness. Secondly, the manner in which they gratify their senses is not just as irrational beasts, irrational animals, but those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. It tells us that their end is ultimately destruction, But that doesn't stop them from continuing to gratify the lusts and the desires of their heart. When you participate in sin, in general, even in the culture and the society, the the time when people commit sin is not during the day, but during the night. The manner in which you participate in sexual immorality, the timing when you uh, participate in drunkenness is not during the day, but you do it at night. But these false teachers are so corrupt are so in bondage to their desires of their hearts and pleasing those desires. They call themselves Christians, and therefore in a moment we're going to see their blots and blemishes among the church of God. And ultimately they bring a a bad name to the cause of Christ because they pursue their sensuality, not just in the nighttime, but in the day. In Roman society, carousing, 
disobeying in sexual immorality and drunkenness. It was not accepted that you do it in the day, you do it in the night, but even these individuals in the name of Christ as blots and blemishes on the church of God are carousing and reviling and doing so in the night. And so the sin just overtakes them. Uh, thirdly, as we continue to read, they says they are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. In other words, they deceive those around them and they deceive themselves, calling themselves believers and Christians. And the reality is they gratify the lust and the desires of their flesh. In 2 Peter 3.14, Peter is going to say this, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent, be found in him in peace without spot and blemish. And yet these individuals are stains upon the gathering of the people of God. They are blemishes, and the reason for that is in the name of Christ, they walk in immorality and sensuality, and they gratify the desires of their flesh, and they say, I can do it. You know, God is a God of grace and mercy. But his grace not only provides us forgiveness of sins, it gives us the power to say no to sin. Romans 6, Paul said it clearly. Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And yet these are individuals who not only participate in it, but give permission to others as well. And because they do, they become blemishes and spots. Carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. This could pro- possibly be talking about the love feast that the churches would be a part of. And during these love feasts, you would also partake of the Lord's table. And yet they deceive themselves and they deceive others thinking that they are genuine believers when indeed they are counterfeits. The text goes on to say they have a heart trained in covetous practices and accursed children. When it says they are trained in covetous practices, that word trained is the Greek word for gymnasium when it speaks of training, perhaps for the Olympic Games. The manner in which you train for them and discipline yourself. Well, these individuals train themselves in their hearts to be greedy. And so as they pursue greed and as they pursue covetousness and want what is not theirs... They continue in that and they get worse and worse. And so they train themselves in sin and immorality. When you walk in sin and persistent disobedience, willful disobedience to God, ultimately you are not walking in freedom. You are walking in bondage. And that bondage becomes stronger and stronger and it's more difficult to break. It says, um, verse 15, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor. Listen, these are not believers, genuine believers who have lost their salvation. These are counterfeit Christians who were never saved in the first place. And because of that, they walk in immorality. And you thought they were believers because of how deceitful they are and how they have the vocabulary language of a Christian. But ultimately, their sinful desires expose themselves in their sinful activities. And it says they have forsaken the right way. Christians in the beginning uh, weren't referred to as Christians. That's actually a term that... Uh, people used to slander Christians a bit. Oh, they're Christians. But they were described as those who followed the way. Jesus described himself as the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. These are individuals who have no longer following the right way and have gone astray. They're following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He followed the ways of greed. And for those of you who are not familiar with Balaam, you can read about him in Numbers 22 to 24, and it's really a magnificent description of a real weasel. This guy, Balaam, at first seems like an all right guy. Seems like a, a guy who, you know, he's got these prophetic gifts, but he uses his prophetic gifts in order to add to his wallet, and out of greed, out of the, it says here, the wages of unrighteousness, he, he pursues them. Verse 16 says, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. If you don't know the story. There is this guy named Balaam. And Balaam is asked by the king of Moab, by the name of Balak, to come and to curse Israel. 
And so he makes this request and Balaam says, well, I can't do anything the Lord doesn't allow me to. So he has a conversation with the Lord and the Lord says, you're not going to curse Israel, you're going to bless them. And he gives him permission basically to go and meet the king of Moab, Balak, but God knows in his heart his motives are wrong. And so what, what ends up happening is God allows an angel to come and stop Balaam from going any further along with his donkey. But Balaam doesn't have enough spiritual sense as much as his donkey. And Balaam can't see the angel, but the donkey can. And the donkey doesn't go any further. And this really upsets Balaam. Balaam hits his donkey three times. And after hitting his donkey, God gives the donkey the ability to speak. And the donkey speaks to Balaam. And Balaam basically is outraged. He's talking to a donkey, by the way. And he tells this donkey, if I could, if I had a sword, I'd kill you right here. And ultimately, God opens Balaam's eyes to see that this angel was stopping him and has a conversation with Balaam. But Balaam is rebuked by his donkey. What's the point of this? These are false teachers who lack spiritual sense. They lack the same spiritual sense that Balaam had because his donkey had more spiritual sense than him. It's almost like a false teacher leading a small group. You come to their house and because they are a false teacher, they have a pet dog. And what basically is being said here is that pet dog has more spiritual sense than this guy. So this guy, Balaam and false teachers lack spiritual sense. They, they are ignorant and they reject the way of Christ and follow another way. Verse 16, but he was rebuked in his iniquity, a dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. It's not that this prophet was insane, but he was driven by greed. And that's what these false teachers are driven by. They're not genuine, they are counterfeits and they expose themselves accordingly. So this morning, we're reminded in light of how dangerous they are due to their sensuality, be discerning. First, be discerning, knowing false teaching is often revealed in sinful living. How are these false teachers exposed? Not just by the false teaching they bring, but by the lifestyle that they live that is antithetical to the word of God. Let me read to you the qualifications of an elder or a pastor in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It says this in the first seven verses. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of bishop, he desires a good work. If you pay attention to the qualifications of, of teachers of the word who are to teach sound doctrine, the key character traits are those of character. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Um, character matters. And so when we're talking about teaching and preaching the word, we're reminded that these are character traits that should not just be modeled by the spiritual leaders of the church, by pastors and elders, but should be modeled by the entire church. We should all pursue these character traits as we walk, as God calls us to walk, so that we are not blemishes and blots on the church, so that we are good representatives for the cause of Christ. One of the motivations for us to walk in purity and holiness and to put to death the sin that is in our lives, especially habitual sins, is, 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 is not just because God calls us to walk in obedience, but for the sake of his testimony before the dying world around us. To declare the good news of Jesus and to be a good witness thereof, modeling the right character. And so we're reminded First, be discerning, knowing false teaching is often revealed in sinful living. Secondly, be discerning, seeing false teachers and the sin they walk in from God's perspective. I don't know if you heard some of the things we've just said about false teachers, but it's quite harsh. I was listening to Kevin DeYoung who was talking about this text and he was saying, can you imagine a blogger who came out and wrote something very similar about a modern day minister 
or a preacher, maybe on television or of a local church, and describe them as irrational beasts born to be captured and to be destroyed. Can you imagine somebody writing a blog saying, these individuals are blots and blemishes. They, are, they, they have an insatiable appetite for sin. They entice unstable souls. They're t- trained for greed. Can you imagine someone, e- even those folks that, if you were to think about some individuals who you might say, yeah, I think that's a false teacher. Can you imagine even somebody coming out with a blog post describing them in the manner that Peter is through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? We might even look at that and say, whoa, that is pretty harsh. Why does God use Peter to write these terms in such harsh language so that we can see the ugliness of false teachers? And the fruit, the rotten fruit that they bring to see them for what they really are. Yes, they may itch your ears. Yes, they have incredible rhetoric. Yes, they can draw a crowd. But ultimately, their desires are for sin. And their desires are to please themselves, not glorify God or to accomplish the work of the church. And so they need to be seen as they really are. And we need to see the danger of false teachers as they really are, but also the sin that they walk in. Thirdly, be discerning by avoiding these examples of false teachers. First and foremost, how do you avoid this, the example of these false teachers who seek to gratify their senses and the lust and desires of their flesh? Number one, follow Jesus, not your heart. I don't care what the culture tells you. Follow Jesus, not your heart. I don't care how you feel when you wake up in the morning. Follow Jesus, not your heart. I know it's difficult and hard sometimes when someone offends you or commits a sin against you. It's difficult to obey God and to forgive that person. But follow Jesus, not your heart. Secondly, admit your weakness and how you are prone to wander. We sang it this morning. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. Every morning, I believe we need to wake up recognizing our tendency to be deceived by sin. How easily we are prone to wander and leave the God we love. May we not wake up so presumptuous to think that we can make it without starting our day without prayer or spending time in the word. May we every morning we awake say, God, I am desperate for you because if you're not going to be with me today, there's no point in me going about this this place or that place, going to work or going to the store, going to the doctor's office. If you're not going with me, I'm not going at all. We need God. We're desperate for him. That's why when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he told them to pray this way, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why do you need to pray that? Because of how prone we are to wander, how prone we are to leave the God we love, and how much we need every morning and every day throughout the day say, Lord, here's my heart, here's my heart, here's my heart. Take and seal it for your courts above. May those words not just be uh, lyrics that we read, but truly a prayer that we pray. And then thirdly, exercise accountability. This morning, if you are going to avoid the example of these false teachers or walk in the sin that they walk in, accountability is important. I'd like to suggest this morning, if there is a sin that only you and God know about, that's dangerous. If there's a sin that that you've been struggling with and you've had a hard time breaking and it's only you and God know, know about it, it's a dangerous place to be. God, the, the Satan loves to isolate. This morning, I, I wanted to be very practical in terms of accountability, not just in terms of finding an accountability partner, but kind of questions you should answer and share with your accountability partner. Let me give you seven or eight of them first. What are three questions you hope no one will ask? Share that with your accountability partner. What are the three most embarrassing areas of your life? What are three people you wish everything could be made right with? People in your life that you're not right with that you want someone else to know and pray for you about? What are your three biggest regrets? 
What are three dreams you would like to see come true someday? What a great to have an accountability partner who's praying for you and encouraging you. Three things that make you angry. Three bad attitudes that you struggle with. This morning, it's so important that we have somebody that we can talk with who, who knows our biggest struggles, who knows our biggest dreams, who can walk alongside of us and encourage us and, and, and say, yeah, you're not all right, I'm not all right. We're all just sinners being conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus. We're not perfect, but Lord willing, we are looking more like Jesus every day. And today I look a little bit more like Jesus than yesterday. That's why God designed church to be a community. Discipleship, it wasn't designed to happen just in isolation, just between you and God in your prayer closet, even though that's important, or taking time to, to read the word, but in fellowship with the people of God as iron sharpens iron. If you don't have an accountability, get one, especially one that you can be open and transparent with, that you can pray with. That's what discipleship is really all about. And so these false teachers are dangerous because of their rebellious nature, because of their sensuality and giving permission for others to pursue the same thing. And lastly, because they are deceiving We get to hear in verses 17 all the way to verse 22 the extent to the danger that they demonstrate. It tells us in verse 17, um, they, they promise help but leave you empty. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. If you're in the desert and you are parched and you are looking for water and you see ahead of you some water and you run to it and you're so excited and you get to the well and it's empty, that's what false teachers are like. They promise you these the hope, they promise you prosperity and blessing and, and happiness and joy and the reality is they will come up empty tells us in verse 17, there are clouds carried by a tempest, mists that are carried by a storm. You know, um, grew up in Arizona, and so in Arizona, especially during the summertime, they have, um, they have monsoon season, and that's when it's the rainy season. And there are times when, uh, because we don't got a bunch of trees back in Arizona, you just look around and you can see storms all around you. Storms in every direction, you see the lightning bolts, and it's amazing to watch, especially as the storms get closer. But what's being described here is that sometimes when you see the storms all around you and you're waiting for the water to come and pour down, sometimes it never comes. (laughs) And you need the water to come and water the ground that is parched, and yet it never comes, and that's the description of false teachers here. You see the clouds, you see the rain clouds, they're starting to develop, but they leave you empty. And their fate is described in verse 17, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Peter, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reminds us again and again and again the fate of these false teachers and all who follow them. Verse 18, it tells us into the next couple of verses, not only do they promise help, but leave you empty, but they promise freedom, but leave you in bondage. For if when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, in other words, when they speak, it's eloquent, it's persuasive. Woo! You get done listening to a false teacher and they itch your ears, you leave. And you say, that is an excellent speaker. They speak with confidence. They are presumptuous. They are bold. But the text tells us they speak great swelling words of emptiness. (laughs) They allure through the lusts of the flesh, through the lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Who are we talking about there? Who are those whom the false teachers prey on? Not those who are grounded in the word, but those who are new in the faith. Those who are unestablished. And so that's where the danger presents itself, who have escaped those who live in error. Verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. This is another cry of our culture. This is another song of our society. They tell you that you shouldn't follow God. You shouldn't live in accordance with the word of God because You need to live freely, free to pursue the desires of your heart, 
not bound by the restrictions of God and his word, but free to do whatever you want. But the Bible clearly teaches us, and the fruit of trying to do that will show you that the reality is you're not free, you're in bondage. And you're in bondage to anything you obey. Ultimately, you say, I can live however I want. I'm not going to live according to God's will. I'm going to move in with my boyfriend or my girlfriend, and I'm going to walk in sexual immorality. Ultimately, you think you're walking in freedom, but ultimately that brings greater bondage. You say, I can pursue, I can pursue uh, my fleshly desires outside of my marriage, and I can look at pornography, or I can pursue a, a, an adulterous relationship, even though it might be emotional. And we say, no, we're free to do whatever we want, but the reality is it places you in bondage. You follow the desires of your heart and I will show you an individual who pursues a sin that cannot satisfy them and so they keep trying to get more and more and more. Try to pursue the desires of your flesh and your heart and there are people who will tell you today don't follow it because it doesn't lead to freedom. It leads to bondage. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. And so this morning, we're reminded that it doesn't lead to freedom, it leads to more bondage. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. You say, well, is it possible for you to lose your salvation? No, the Bible doesn't tell us you can lose your salvation. I'll read you a couple texts in a moment that tell us that. But this speaks of these individuals who are counterfeit Christians. Gives them language as if they, in their deceitful ways, as they secretly bring in destructive heresies, they look like Christians. They even hear the gospel message, but having heard it, they walk in willful, willful ignorance. They pursue their fleshly desires, and they are not genuine believers. They are false believers. And it says it would be better for them at the beginning. In other words, when you are not genuine and you try out these things or those things, it hardens your heart towards them even further. Oh, this Christian thing doesn't even work. I've tried it and I'm not finding what I'm looking for. Verse 21, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered to them. Verse 22, but it had happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and is so having washed to her wallowing in the mire. You know that proverb when it t talks about as a, a fool as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool returns to its sin. Any one of us who's had a dog and your dog has vomited, it's the most disgusting thing when your dog goes back to the vomit, and it's even worse when they start to eat it up. And that's the picture here of a false teacher and a fool who goes back to their sin a pig who goes back after it's been washed to its instinctual desires. It goes back to the mud where it came from. Genuine believers are demonstrated by the fruit that they have. Now, works don't save us, but a genuine believer will not fail to produce the fruit of good works in their lives couple verses that remind us that if God has begun a good work in us, he's going to finish it. And that for us who are genuine in our faith, we will persevere. Romans 8, 29 to 30 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Notice there, it's in the past tense. John 6, 38 to 39 says, For Jesus, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up the last day. Jesus said, if you belong to him and the Father has given you to him, he will not let you go. The fact that you are in the process of being sanctified, having already been justified, and one day you will be glorified is not dependent on how close you hold on to him, but how much he's holding on to you. But someone might take a look at texts like this and say, hey, this is putting into question the fact that if I'm genuinely saved, am I really saved? Because there is some sin in my life. 
There are some things in my life that, that shouldn't be there. I haven't completely submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ in any way, but that shouldn't keep you from believing the truth of your salvation and God's sovereignty over it. It should affirm it. And the way that it should affirm it is as you read these things and you say, my life is out of alignment or that attitude shouldn't be there or that relationship needs to be cut off. As a genuine, authentic follower of Christ, you cut those things out of your life. You walk in obedience to the will of God and in accordance with his word. You follow after Jesus, denying yourself, taking up your cross, and follow after him. A text like this reminds us and motivates us to pursue Christ and him crucified. And so they promise help, but they leave you empty. They promise freedom, but they leave you in bondage. It would have been better if they hadn't even been among the people of God, having heard the truth, but while being counterfeit Christians, having left it. If I could give us final takeaways, they would be this. First, first, be discerning of modern day false teachers. Our text clearly tells us from verse 1 all the way to verse 22 that false teachers are inevitable. And because they are inevitable, they are also dangerous. The question is not when they come among us, but the fact that they are already here. And we need to be discerning when it comes to the church we choose to attend, the churches we recommend, the podcasts we listen to or recommend to others, the Christian resources that we receive that are available to us and that we make available to others, we need to be discerning. Secondly, and I pray this is your biggest takeaway, that as you read this ugly portrait of false teachers painted, that it would not just let you see the ugliness that false teachers present themselves to be, at least as they are according to the Spirit of God as it's been revealed here, but that that ugly portrait would cause you to run to the beauty of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the beauty of Jesus. My prayer this morning is you would see the ugliness, not just of the character trait of these false teachers and the sin that they walk in, but it would cause you to see the beauty of Christ in all things. My prayer, your greatest takeaway as mine would be, is that our greatest desire would be to follow Jesus, to see how beautiful he truly is. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've all missed the mark. We're all in Perfect. None of us are sinless. You think you're sinless. You are one of the person who doesn't know the truth. And so we're reminded that we're all sinners. We miss the mark. We're deserving of his wrath and his judgment. But we're also told that the good news is Jesus left heaven for earth, came to die on a cross in order to forgive our sins and to provide us everlasting life. If you haven't trusted in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, the invitation is to come to him today, receive forgiveness and everlasting life. Secondly, my prayer is that you would see and continue to see the beauty of having the ability to have prayer time with the Lord and the ability to have time with the Lord not just in prayer but also in times of his in, in, also in the word as you pursue him in all things can we take some time to pray Father we're grateful this morning for your word we're grateful Lord for this portrait of false teachers that's been painted that reminds us not to walk in accordance with the sins that they exhibit or follow them, even though they are deceitful and they secretly bring in destructive heresies. But Lord, that we would follow after you in all things. This morning, I, I pray for anyone who's never trusted in Jesus as their Savior and Lord, that a text like this would invite them to run to the beauty of the Christ and the gospel of Jesus, who died and rose in newness of life. I pray that they can express that in this prayer. Father, I recognize I'm a sinner. I've missed the mark. I've fallen short. I know that Jesus came and died in order to forgive my sins. Today, I make Jesus my Savior and my Lord 
the one I'm going to follow all the days of my life into eternity. Father, uh, I pray, Lord, this morning as uh, we close today and head off into the afternoon that you would uh, continue to be with us and bless us and remind us of these truths. And we pray that the beauty of the gospel would be clearly shared with those, all those children, 117 plus, who will be here to be ministered to. And we pray your blessing upon that as well. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.